incredibly delighted to have you, Ernie. Uh, you guys are about to hear one of the most incredible software stories in the country right now, and it just so happens that it started operations in Atlanta. Uh, Ernie, tell us about Carvana. Sure. Um, so for those of you who don't know, what we are is we're a company that sells cars online. Um, customers can go to our website, they can browse about 7,000 cars, um, they can get approved for and select financing in seconds. Uh, we give them a trade-in value on our website, that takes a couple minutes. They can apply all that to the purchase of the car, sign contracts online, we deliver it to a customer's door, um, and then we give them a seven-day return policy. And then by moving all of that online, instead of kind of the traditional experience of going to a dealership, on average we save customers about $1,500. He's a, a public company CEO, nails it, nails a 30 second pitch, huh? <laughs> um, what's incredible about Carvana is the following. We've heard some amazing companies pitch in the last day. We'll hear some great ones today as well. Uh, how, some, one, the challenge for the investors here is to figure out which of those is gonna get to 100 million. It, it'll happen, one or two of them, but it's really hard to do. What's unique about Carvana is in a matter of five years, it's an $800 million revenue company. The growth is staggering. It is very, very rare and very hard to do. Uh, so maybe would you tell us a little bit about, about you. Before you started Carvana, tell us about, about what led to Carvana as it is today. There's no way anyone cares. You guys care, no one cares. <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll pretend to care, I appreciate that. So um, I grew up uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, played a lot of sports growing up. I, I only bring that up because I think it, it matters a little bit in terms of setting you on this path to, uh, to trying to build something. Um, I, I was lucky enough to get into Stanford where I went to school for four years and had the greatest four years of my entire life. Um, then I went and worked in New York for a little bit. Uh, I was an investment banker, so I did all of the evil investment banking stuff for a while um, and realized that was a great education but probably wasn't for me. Uh, and then moved back to, to Phoenix, um, worked for a larger automotive retailer uh, simultaneously kicked off a, a different company that ended up blowing up spectacularly and you know I lost all my personal savings uh, in, in that endeavor and then after that started Carvana and uh, so far it's working. Yeah. When you go all the way back uh, and you think about the early experiences that you had, uh, is, is there one that stands out that, that in hindsight is clear that was formative for your future role as a CEO? So yeah, I, I would say two. I really do think sports uh, is something I would give a lot of credit to. And I think there's a lot of different paths, and so I, I don't think there's one path that's necessarily the best one, but I, I do think just growing up in team sports where if you fail, the team fails, or if someone on your team you know, fails, you have to kind of deal with that, or you know, if someone on your team causes you to have success, you, you deal with that. I think you just learn so much how to interact with people, and you face kind of failure and defeat, and, and you face that reality all the time. I've got two kids right now. Uh, my daughter actually turned six yesterday on my son's three. And so I think a lot about kind of this culture of like everyone gets a ribbon and everyone, or everyone won the same amount all the time. Um, and I think that comes from a really good place, but I do think that facing the realities of the world um, is an important thing for people. And so I think that sports, for me, played that role and I think wow. that was important. Um, and then I think I gotta give a lot of credit to my parents. They, they definitely just always asked why. If I ever said anything, they would always ask why, and then they always took the time to explain why to me. Um, and I think why is the most powerful question there is. Uh, so I think those two things. Why? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> nice follow-up. Uh, Good job. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, and and, and at, what, <laughs> at what point in your life did you realize, you know what, I'm going to be a CEO? So it, it's funny. So I, I remember at the, at the company I worked at, um, kind of a, a larger company prior to starting the first company that failed, um, one day the CEO of that company asked me, he's like, what do you want to do in the, in the long run? And my answer was very clear. I was just like, well, I, at some point I'm gonna do my own thing and I, I don't even know what that is yet, but I know I'm gonna do my own thing. And his response was, okay, well, why is that important to you? And, and he didn't really, he didn't ask it like, walk me through your vision or how you're gonna do it. He asked it like, what is your psychological deficiency that causes this like need for power? And, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I kind of thought about it for a second. I was like, is that really what's going on here? Um, and, and the answer is that I hope that's not what's going on. Um, I hope it comes down to you know, just because I you know, was asked why so many times growing up and I, I always asked why, I just had a lot of thoughts and I wanted to make sure that I could set a direction for something and make sure that it didn't get muddled. I think a lot of times in, in big companies, um, they can be characterized a bit by compromise and I think Compromise can be good in certain cases, but I think when you're trying to pick a strategy and a direction, you need to kind of know where you're going and just head in that direction, uh, and I want to make sure we could do that. Awesome. 
so let's get to the early days of, uh, of Carvana. A every entrepreneur knows there's a moment where you say, oh, I guess we're doing this, <laughs> or we're doing this. Describe when you first realized or you first decided, what was that moment like when you said, we're going to do this? So again, at this company I was at before, um, I had been constantly pitching kind of big ideas to the CEO about things I thought we should do differently. Um, and he was frustrated by that, I, I think fairly. Um, and so what he said is, why don't you just go out to an auction and do me a favor, find a way that we can save a million bucks the company. And, and this company right. was selling 60,000 cars per year, so I was like 16 bucks a car. That's not a huge swing uh, at that scale. And he's like, just find me a way we can save a million bucks and find the easiest way to save a million bucks and come back with that and don't have it be a big idea. Like, do me that favor. So I went and spent two days at the auction uh, and I came back and I was all excited because I felt like I, I had learned something. Uh, so I put together a presentation for four or five hours and the next day I basically pitched him Carvana. Um, and in fairness to him, he, he sat there and you know, he, he was clearly frustrated um, by the fact that you know, he had given me very clear instructions to not do that, um, and that's what I had done. Um, but he listened, um, and he was like, well, listen, we're not gonna do that. And so I kind of turned that into, okay, well, can, can I have money to do that then? Um, like, I wanna do it. Uh, and I think you know, he then kind of pushed us down that path. So to his credit, uh, that's kind of what kicked it off. Was it something where you felt like this was something you had to do? Uh, is it something that, that kind of happened uh, iteratively, or was there a point where, where you, you just kind of said, you know what, I, I, I don't care about the risk, I don't care about the failure, uh, I, I, it's something I have to do? So I, I just think it was, yeah, have to do is a good way to say it. I, I think it was just, it felt so obvious. So I mean, if you, not to bore people with numbers, but automotive retail is a trillion dollar industry, which to put that in context, you know, like the whole economy is 15 trillion, the retail economy is 5 trillion. So, for every dollar of physical things that are bought and sold in the US, 20 cents of that dollar is car. So the, the market is massive. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's actually sort of amazing that culturally we all understand what it means when we talk about a used car salesman, right? And there are a lot of great used car salesmen out there, so I don't wanna be negative about you know, the whole lot, but the fact that those jokes exist in our culture suggests that there's a, a shared experience there that everyone can you know, resonate with and, and understand. And so I think the fact that people don't love that enormous industry is really, really interesting. That industry hadn't changed meaningfully in 75 years. You know, the way that you buy a car, you, know, you bought them in the, in the 20s pre-depression, you bought them through a catalog, and then after that it was basically dealerships, and it's been that the entire time. And the process has not meaningfully changed, so there's been huge preference changes by consumers, massive technologies become available that you could utilize, and, and the change really hadn't followed that industry. And then it's incredibly fragmented. There's 60,000 dealers in the US, I mean, 60,000 dealers, that's a tremendous number. Um, you, you know, the largest one has a 1.6% market share. So competition is really fragmented. And it was just like, what do you want? You know, it's like you, you've got a massive industry without technology adoption. You know, customers are actively asking for something different. Mm -hmm. It's hugely fragmented without competition. And by the way, people like buying stuff online, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a thing too. So it just felt like, like you're never going to get another shot like this. You got to go. So uh, we had 50 presenting entrepreneurs uh, this uh, today uh, and yesterday. Uh, we have a lot more potential entrepreneurs in the room um, that might be on the fence. Based on this description, uh, wh what advice would you give to those budding entrepreneurs that might be, might think they have the idea, they're not sure if they wanna go for it? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is, I think, um, I think starting companies is, and I, I hate to do this while I'm sitting here having done it, but I think it's like a noble cause. Um, so first thing I would say is I would encourage anyone who wants to do it to do it because I think it's good for the world, right? Like a, a thought experiment I like to run is if you have a huge retailer, let's just say you've got a big box retailer and you have millions of customers that come to your store every day, you can kind of put a pizza parlor like in the back and you can serve mediocre pizza and you're gonna sell pizza because people are already there, right? It's like, it's gonna work. But if you're a guy that wants to start a pizza company and you're gonna be you know, in some back alley somewhere because you can't afford you know, a better place, you better blow people's mind with your pizza or like no one's coming back ever again. And I think that that pressure that exists on startups forces you to build products that are better for the world. And I think that that's really cool and noble and positive. Um, so I would encourage you in that way. I would discourage you in the sense that if you're considering starting a company, you probably have some of these same psychological deficits that, that many of us have where you think things are gonna be easier than they are and you think you can see a clear path. And the truth is like, you're going into a dogfight that just doesn't end. Um, you know, it's so hard and it takes so long and you don't sleep so many nights 
um, and you, you walk past people that you respect, that you can just see on their face that they think you're failing, um, and those periods of time last years. Um, so it's exhausting and brutal, um, but, but you know, if it works, the payoff is, is high, and I think even if it doesn't work, the endeavor is brutal, or is, uh, is noble. I, I think like trying is, we all benefit from luck, those who end up kind of on the side of success uh, benefit a lot from luck, but I think trying itself is a noble aim. Well, let's talk about that success. Uh, you went public this year. You started operations in Atlanta in 2012 or 13. Uh, so you, Atlanta will take credit for the IPO. <laughs> you can have it, by the way. Yeah, hot Atlanta took us off, uh, for sure. Yeah, so uh, uh, tell us about that decision-making process. At what point did you say, yeah, I think we're gonna go public? And how did you like walk us through that thought process? Because there are a lot of companies now that get late stage funding, SoftBank's just up in a $100 billion fund for companies like this. So there's a credible argument for doing a private IPO as it's called in some cases. So tell us about your, your thought process about going public and how you, how you worked up to that decision. So I think the way we try to think about everything is just what's best for the business. Um, and, and so I'll answer it that way first, then I'll roll into some kind of personal thoughts on it. So I, I think you know something that we kind of realized early on is if we deliver on our value proposition, which is make a lot of cars available to customers, sell them for a lower price, make the experience take 10 minutes instead of four hours, you know, give them a seven day return policy, there's sort of no rational reason why a person shouldn't buy from us. Like they're benefiting in every possible way. You know, the car quality's high, they're spending less time, they're spending less money, they have more certainty around their purchase because of the return policy. So rationally, you know, that kind of should work. The question is, do you believe all those rational arguments? You know, as a consumer, you know, when you're gonna go enter your financial information into a website that you've never heard of to buy a $20,000 thing, do you believe that all that stuff is true? Um, and, and I think credibility is really, really important there. So we've noticed, Everything we've done throughout our company history, whether it's um, you know advertising on TV for the first time or building these big vending machines, um, anything that creates credibility, I think benefits the business. And so we thought going public would would benefit the business in that way. Um, we also, by virtue of you know, our business model, we have real assets. So you know many technology companies you know have an office and servers and physical or, or it's software technology. They don't really have physical assets. We've got you know 10,000 10, cars roughly. Uh, we've got four facilities where we, you know, certify those cars prior to selling them. There are 40-acre facilities with hundreds of employees. Um, you know, we sell cars to customers that are utilizing financing. We have our own logistics network with hundreds of trucks that are delivering cars around the country. All of that stuff can be financed with equity, but it's very, very expensive to finance it with equity. Uh, it's much cheaper to finance it with debt, and being a public company, generally, you can get access to debt uh, much more inexpensively. So I think for us, you know, that was important. I also think selling cars lends itself to many, many different partnerships on the supply side, on the customer acquisition side, and even in the transaction itself. Uh, and I think, you know, being a public company is helpful when you're trying to go partner with, you know, large Fortune 500 companies. Uh, mm -hmm. It's much easier to kind of get in the door than it is, uh, you know, when you're a startup with, with kind of an idea. So I think all of that said, relative to any other company out there, or not any other company, but many companies, we should go public sooner, right? Because we have real benefits to the business that, that kind of are born of going public. Um, so we went, you know, we were a four-year-old company, we went public. Um, and then, side note, personally, um, I would not wish it on my worst enemy. It's not fun <laughs> <laughs> to be a public company CEO, but, but I think it's great for the business. Well, you're a public company CEO yeah. now, so um, yeah. uh, you weren't before. At what point, did, how did you get comfortable that you were ready to go public? It, it, you know, not knowing what you were getting into, how did you get comfortable that the, the business was ready? I think, so the one thing, I think there's two components to that. One is, is the public market ready to accept the business? And I think um, on that side, I think as long as you have monetization figured out and your path to growth and, and kind of you know, profitability is relatively straightforward, mm -hmm. I, I think you're in an okay spot there. And you know, we sell cars, like our revenue model's very, very clear. Um, so that wasn't particularly hard. So I, I think the public markets we believed were ready for us. And then you know, as far as us being ready, I knew we had the people that could do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that we could get the work done. Um, you know, I, I knew that when you talk to people in um, the startup world, they said, don't do it. Um, I knew that when you talk to people in the public world, they said, do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it was hard to, hard to figure out what the right answer was there, and we decided to go for it. And uh, with the benefit of hindsight now, I mean, anytime you grow that fast, it's really hard to keep up with the systems and processes that, that are required uh, just to be a good company, nonetheless a public one. If, if, if you uh, were give, giving advice to entrepreneurs in the room that are thinking of going public, 
what's a, what's an area that you might have might encourage them to focus on more, no, from the you know with the benefit of knowing your experience. I would just say make sure you feel like things are are predictable. Um, yeah, I, I think right. make sure you feel like you have a good sense of where things are going. Make sure you're not. Um, there are many examples of public companies where if you are trying to you know pivot or add a new revenue stream or create kind of a tangential business, like you just don't get credit for it. If, if you can't see it in financials in the next year or two and get analysts to model it, you don't get credit for it. So I think you need to feel like your story can be told through financials um, and you need to feel like it's predictable and, and you've got the capacity to produce those numbers. Um, we've talked a, b a little bit uh, before about value creation versus value redistribution. Uh, share your thoughts on that a little bit. Yeah, so this is like a pet um, thought of mine, I suppose, but I, I do think that there are many, um, any business I think you can, you can kind of break down the value that gets created by the business and the value that gets redistributed by the business. So going back to this concept of like a, a pizza entrepreneur, um, if there's already a pizza shop sitting on one corner selling 100 pizzas a day, and then another pizza shop pops up next to it and starts selling the exact same kind of pizza, and all of a sudden now there's just 50 pizzas being sold by each company, you know, all that really happened is, you know, pizza shop number two took sales away from pizza shop number one, and if it's the exact same pizza, consumers are in the same place, there's an extra business, but there's been no value created. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you create some, you know, magical pepperoni mix and you have, you know, way better pizza, you actually create value. Maybe now, you know, the other guy sells 50 and you sell 70, there's, you know, 20 extra transactions and consumers are a little bit happier. I think it's interesting to look at any company because in that case, you know, this company may have 70 of revenue, but they created 20 of value you know, in the sense that those would be incremental transactions. Many businesses today, and I think a lot of what is popular in technology, I think is more about value redistribution than it is about creation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate because I think it's not necessarily creating value for the world a as mm -hmm. much. So, for example, I think, um, and, and I'm going to you know, speak in broad strokes here, there's certainly caveats to all this, and every company, including ours, there's a redistribution component to the value we create. So, I, I you know, I don't mean to be speaking from a, my pedestal here, but I think, um, I think many marketplace businesses effectively are sort of commandeering the customer relationship, you know, and, and taking away the supply chain or, or sort of sitting between the customer and the supply chain, and then they're you know, redistributing profits out of the supply chain into kind of the marketing uh, aspect of the business. I think um, subscription businesses are really popular these mm -hmm. days. I think there's a lot of value creation to subscription businesses because you do reduce transaction costs and it's easier for people in many ways. There's also all of us have 20 things we're getting charged for on our credit cards that we've forgotten about, right? Um, and that's not value creation, that's just kind of revenue generation. Right, yeah. And so I, I do, you know, whenever I get a chance to speak to a room of people that are you know, thinking about starting companies, I always try to just push them in the direction of like, think about how the world's different because of your company and try to do something that creates value because it takes just as much work to create value as to redistribute value, right? It's, it's yeah. hard to get value and so you might as well create new value. So. A, a, a lot of value creation comes from innovation, and a lot of innovation comes from investment in R&D. As a public company, you don't get to throw money around a lot and, you know, to try different things. So how do you think about funding activities around innovation in, as a public company trying to hit its quarter? Yeah, well, so um, I, th I think you have to make sure that you set your investors up for that. I mean, I, th I think the most important thing there, whether it's mm -hmm. public or private, is just are your investors along for the same ride that you're on, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And are you, you know, conveying to them where that, you know, reinvestment's going to be? I mean, obviously, Amazon's done a tremendous, you know, job of, right. you know, reinvesting endless amounts of money forever. Um, and, and the market supports that as long as you make it clear that's what you're going to do. Um, so I, I think that's important. But, but yeah, I, I think, I do think value creation comes from innovation. But I think redistribution also comes from innovation. And so an example that I'll use is, you know, something that's close to us, automotive retail. And I, I don't mean to vilify anyone, but if you look at automotive retail, the economics are... I think fascinating, everyone else is probably gonna fall asleep a little bit, but over the last 10 or 15 years, dealership profits are about the exact same amount, but kind of profits on the car sale itself have fallen by 25 or 30%. And all that's happened is basically profits have moved into like, you know, they mark up your interest rate by more, or they sell you a warranty for $3,000 that costs, you know, $1,000, uh, you know, to, to service. A and what's really happening there is they're innovating in marketing, right? They're realizing mm -hmm. that if they can put a car up on a listing site for, a price that is not really sustainable by the business, but then they can get you in the door and they can sell you other things that cost an extra 2,000 bucks. Right. Economically, they're in the same spot. Yeah. You're in the same spot, right, but now yeah. you spent four hours in a chair you didn't want to be in right. and nothing really changed and it's, it's just a marketing innovation, right? right it's, right. Not a, it's not a value creating innovation. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do something a little different now. Um, this is uh, uh, this is uh, an advertisement that, that Carvana did. And before we roll the tape, do you want to give a little preamble to it? Um, sure. So this is our first ad. Um, we were terrified, so we knew we wanted to advertise on TV. We didn't know at this time that credibility was gonna was gonna actually help us. Um, you know, these commercials are incredibly expensive to produce um, for reasons I don't totally understand and probably never will, but they are incredibly expensive to produce. And we knew we had one shot to produce it because um, that's all the money that we had. And we decided to go for it. We took a big swing. There's a lot of risk in this particular type of production. Um, and luckily it ended up working. So maybe that's the preamble. Great. Yeah. Well, let's roll the tape. If you just sign Wavy that. Winston loved cars. I don't feel comfortable signing that. I don't get the map. But he did not love car Was dealerships. This the same car we talked about? What's this dealer preparation? The fuzzy map. I'm so sorry. The bait and switch. We talked about. This really bummed Wavy Winston out. So we set out to, well, find a better way to buy a car. And now, Wavy Winston is feeling wavy again. Get the car without the car salesman. Carvana.com, the better way to buy a car. So, uh, yeah, yeah please, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Trip can attest to this. It is incredibly hard to get that right. It is just really hard. There's an art form to it. And so, walk us through the process of how you came up with the idea. How much creative liberty did you give? Walk, walk through the process of, of how you actually came up with the uh, with the, with that with that great ad. Yes, yeah, so, so many people at Carvana are very systematic thinkers, and I don't think systematic thinkers are the best storytellers necessarily. Um, when you've got a medium like a uh, you know, TV commercial for 30 seconds, there's infinite possible commercials out there. And when you are used to kind of deductive reasoning, you, know, you always want to get the bullet points out there. So like my version of the story is, you know, save 1500 bucks, buy a car in 10 minutes, get it delivered to your door, you know, large selection. Uh, the pitch that I gave you before, that's not super interesting for a consumer that's like flipping through channels. Uh, and so, you know, we had our creative team that basically said we should do this, let's commandeer this character from dealerships and let's, you know, put fishing wire, you know, all over the place and try to figure out a way to make it look like there's expressions on the, the thing's face and let's have him be depressed, you know, uh, from what he sees at a dealership all the time. And that felt like a pretty bad idea, I think, um, <laughs> at first. And, and then it was expensive. Um, but but they convinced us to do it, and I remember on Halloween in 2013, it was the year that we launched, we built this, it was, we got the first cut, and the first cut looked like the worst, you know, budget Muppets episode you'd ever seen, ever. Like, you could see the fishing wire and the expressions were all wrong. And I, I went out with my, my daughter at the time was two, and you know, we went trick-or-treating, and I had a stomachache the entire time, because I knew <laughs> that we had completely screwed it up. But, uh, but two or three cuts later, it turned out okay. And it still today is our best commercial. We, we measure them a bunch of different ways, and it, it's our best commercial today. H how personally involved were you in the creative side of it versus you know, delegating to the team, knowing that this is really an extension of you, it's the, it's the, it's the brand for the company? So how, how did you draw that line between kind of really being engaged with the first ad versus um, uh, delegating more? So I was incredibly engaged the entire time, and my value was unquestionably negative. It's like <laughs> I, was, I just created stress and pointed people in the wrong direction and questioned everything that was being done. It was not helpful. How did you uh, use market research versus kind of gut um, in, in, in making decisions around the creative side of things? I think on the creative side, you you have to use gut more so than, the, I mean, I think you have to have insights. So market research, I think, is helpful to right. understand, you know, the business. But if you feel like you understand the business, then I think it's just about, like, what can you do that's going to grab someone's attention and make them think for half a second about your company, mm -hmm. right? Like, it, it's very, very hard. Um, you know, I don't know if th there's market research out there that says Geico should use cavemen. You know, it's <laughs> like, but, but cavemen seem to work really, really well. Yeah. So I think... Um, that's something where you got to trust the creatives and you know they're going to be wrong most of the time like all of us are um, but when they're right it's you know it works and uh uh what did you learn from that first ad that uh, that helped you become maybe you know that allowed you to evolve for the future ads or so creative activity I, I think that ad worked and then on the next ad you know i tried to force messaging way more into it uh -huh. um, and got way more involved and you know felt like I really understood at that point. And then our next ad was our worst ad um, by a long way, by any like objective <laughs> measure of how effective right. it is. So I think the some of those two ads I learned that I'm supposed to trust the creative team. So <laughs> you're clearly an analytical guy. You, you reference the numbers. You have a banking background. 
how do you, do you measure efficacy with these ads? Uh, it may seem obvious, but something to me in the audience may not know. Yeah, so I think you know TV. Um, you know what's nice is when you use like a when you air these different commercials, you can generally see like the exact second they started and when they ended uh, in every geography, and then you can map that against your traffic and you can see where your traffic bursts are. And so as long as you believe that kind of like a you know, a traffic burst for commercial one versus commercial two. Uh, is still going to be proportionate in terms of sales, you know, relative to that initial burst. Then you can sort of measure them that way, and that's pretty direct and clear. Um, you can also use YouTube, right? If, if you think, even if you think uh, TV maybe is a better broadcast medium, you can use YouTube to say, let's air all these different commercials where we have direct feedback from consumers, and let's measure them based on the direct feedback there, and then presume that it's the same, yeah. uh, you know, in TV. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if none of that works, I think the other method that we'll use is use to really heavy tests because. Marketing attribution, I do think, is one of the hardest you know, problems out there. Um, so if you just take a single commercial and you air it you know, really aggressively in a market for a month, and you take a different commercial and air it really aggressively in a different market for a month, and then don't air any commercials in another market, you can start to just get a sense you know, from like a macro read of what's happening. Um, but we try all those things, and it is, it's hard. Yeah, it is very hard. And, and in fact, uh, Brad Feld talked yesterday about the importance of conflict and, and, and how that can be so important to uh, the ultimately the, the team's functionality or dysfunctionality. So in my experience, those ad, ad uh, processes can have a lot of conflict. Um, maybe it was all smooth sailing here, but what were some of the issues that the team debated? Um, you know, get as specific as you can, but I'm kind of curious about the specific issues where there was a real debate about, um, you know, white versus red. Yeah, well, so I mean, I think the clearest debate that still happens all the time internally is just, we do save customers 1500 bucks. Uh, and when people shop for cars, a very natural way that they shop is they go to a you know, listing site and they sort by price. Mm -hmm. And so that's really powerful. If you can actually save people money, right, when they're buying a car and that's their number one kind of shopping mechanism, you theoretically should use that. You know, that's one kind of camp that just says like, we need to just hammer that message as hard as we possibly can. There's another camp that kind of says, okay, well, if you turn on the TV for four seconds, you're gonna see you know, zero down drives and 4,000 bucks on the hood and 8,000 off MSRP and you know, 10 sale, 10 sale, 10 sale. And like the, the idea of price has just been abused so mm -hmm. badly in automotive retail that even if you can save people 1,500 bucks, you can't cut through that noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's one of the debates that, that took place in this commercial and all the others is just what, what is the message that you are trying to send? There's, it's kind of a mix of what's the most important message and what can actually be heard, right? Yeah, it's like right. maybe you can't get the most important message across because right. the, the environment doesn't allow it. So you got to find the most important message that you can get across and get that one across. Right. And in this one, we went more for the feel of buying a car than, than kind of you know, the, the price and the time savings. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned Geico as a just passing reference. Uh, who do you think does this really well and why? Who do you admire on the, uh, you know, on the commercial man. advertising side? Um, man, that's a good question. So I, I, I think Geico's done an a interesting job. They've built characters for a long period of time, and they continually rotate them out, and mm -hmm. they always seem to do pretty well. Now, they also spend you know, a billion dollars every year advertising, so you're going to remember right. you know, their stuff. <laughs> I thought uh, the most interesting man in the world was awesome. Um, I thought that was yeah. a great commercial. Um, I thought the Old Spice guy um, that, that was in the shower for a while back in the day, that, that guy was awesome. Who doesn't like a guy in the shower? I mean, am I right? <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. Th those are a couple things that yeah. popped in my mind. Yeah. All kind of disruptive, kind of provocative. It, exactly. Uh, Grab your. I, I think that's the yeah. key. It's like you're watching TV. You don't care about the commercial. So it's like you have to make you like you have to snap out of your days and like it, it, you know take in the message. And so you need to do something interesting. I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to overall thoughts on leadership. Um, w describe maybe the best two or three pieces of advice you've been given about being an effective leader? Yeah, so I think by far and away the most important thing uh, to leadership is that you have a real cause. I, I think um, you need to have something that you can explain to people they can get behind uh, mm -hmm. and feel good about. And so I think that if you have a real mission, that's just prerequisite to, to leadership in general. And I think we even see dark edges of that. Um, you know, countries come together in wartime, right? Mm -hmm. When there's a cause, people come together. Mm -hmm. And so I think a cause, you know, hopefully a positive one, uh, I think is an important prerequisite. I think the next thing is, you know, in the world of, you know, building a company and then, you know, putting it out to completely objective consumers that don't care about you at all, you know, they, they just care about making the right choice for them. 
you face objective feedback that is just absolutely brutal. Yeah. And I think a really important part of that is just making sure that you've got a really strong team around you and a really strong team that complements your own weaknesses. Um, so I think being aware of your weaknesses and acknowledging them is really important. Um, I think the last one is I think you have to, you have to kind of lead by example, right? I think um, you know, when we're interviewing people, a, a lot of times something I'll hear is people start to talk about how much you know, pride they take in managing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that can be great. There are great things about taking pride in managing, but if, if you're a leader who kind of takes pride in doing, and then managing is something that happens because you're doing and you're leading and people see you doing, right? And then they want to do that too, and right. then they ask you questions, and then you know, they're being built because they're seeing you do. I just think that's generally so much more productive than sitting in a room and telling them all the things that you know, right? Yeah, um, right. Which is a different kind of management. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are the most important things, just kind of have a real mission, you know, understand your weaknesses, and then lead by example. So uh, how consistent has that mission been? As you, as you kind of talk about the cause to your team, if it's a, a Friday email or all hands meeting, is it always the same message in terms of what our, what our mission is? I hope so. I, I think you have to ask the team. But so I, I think um, I, I think the, the two non-negotiables are basically give customers incredible experiences, and that's first and foremost yeah. by a long, long way, and then be smart with your costs because I think the root of bad customer experiences in automotive I do think is undifferentiated cost structures that force people to find ways to get extra revenue out of every customer. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can be smart with your costs, you can build good experiences into your business model. Yeah. Um, so those are the two things I think are kind of non-negotiable. And then, you know, from there, we're always trying to figure stuff out. Yep. And then also in terms of the advice you received on leadership, you mentioned having a great team around you and kind of building that team. Uh, what types of things do you do to build le leadership qualities in your team? And it can be as, as small as, you know, individual coaching or offsite training or informal. What, what do you do to, to help build, build uh, leadership qualities in your team? So I I really do just believe that kind of learning by doing is the, is the best way to learn anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you can do a good job hiring great leaders um, and then put people with a lot of potential around those great leaders, I think the rest kind of takes care of itself. And I, I do think, you know, investing in, in, you know, leadership coaching and so I think that can make sense in, in certain instances. But I think the most important thing is just every day, if you have a leader that you respect, that you're learning from, You'll you'll learn very very quickly. Uh, I think that you know having people around that have mutual respect for each other is the most important thing. And, and also going back to that that uh, theme around conflict, how do you both encourage teamwork and collaboration and encourage dissent? How do you allow those two to coexist? So I think collaboration with me and never dissent, and then dissent <laughs> elsewhere. No, <laughs> um, no. So I, I think um, I think you just need to have people that. Are, if you have people that are curious and have been curious their whole life long, yeah. right, and, and they, they ask why all the time, they're used to being open-minded to what other people are saying. Right. And I think if you have people that, you know, you put enough of those people together in a room and they start to have respect for each other, it's, it doesn't have to be dissent. It's like it's respect for different perspectives. Um, and I think, you know, those sorts of people can tend to have, you know, disagreements and conversations that aren't necessarily, you know, super combative, um, but, but you can get to kind of, you know, different answers. And so I think it's all about the people you put in the room. I, I really do. I think it's hard to fix, like something we always say is, it's really hard to fix people problems with processes. Like once you start trying to fix people problems with processes, you've kind of already lost. It's like the, right. the game's already over because you're just not gonna do it. And that's how bureaucracy gets built. That's how all of a sudden you find yourself with you know, a million layers of hierarchy and a billion processes because you try to fix people problems with process. I, I just think if you put good people in the room, you're in a good spot. One of the toughest things about people problems as a senior manager or as a CEO is realizing when you've got uh, a, a star athlete that's not good on the team. And, yeah. uh, or even if it's a, just a, that's one of the hardest, but any athlete that's not, not working on the team. Describe like how, how do you react when you, how do you know when somebody's not the fit and how, do, how quickly do you act on it? How do you deal with that? Do you, do you, you know, some people are really kind of quick guns, other guys try to, or, or women try to, um, you know, manage through and to, you know, get the get Michael Jordan to play basketball instead of baseball. Um, how do you manage situations where where a person's not working out? Yeah. Well, so I think the most important thing, like the influence you have in the world or in a company or anywhere, is a function of kind of what you directly do and also how you influence other people around you. Mm -hmm. And I think 
as long as the influence on other people around you isn't negative, I, I think you at least have a chance to, to kind of, you know, figure something out. If, if you start to negatively influence people around you, it's really, really hard to make up for that with your individual contributions, right? right so I, right. I think that if you see people that are kind of cancerous inside the organization, I think that's the problem and you gotta move on. If you see people that pretend like they're busy and take credit for other people's work and then, you know, blame when things don't go right, like that's a disaster. Um, As you've gotten bigger, do you, do you measure that effect uh, you know, what what is the what do people think about people or is it still kind of a qualitative you know informal feedback process I think it's more qualitative I, I think that's I we, we do it qualitatively just because I think that's that stuff is so hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll do 360s, but then I think the most valuable feedback, you know, comes in the written responses, right, not yeah. in like the survey results. Yeah. It's just hard to interpret that for yeah. individuals that are so complex. Yeah. Uh, but you, yeah, I think people are negative influence on other people. You gotta, you gotta move on. I think you always deal with the star player thing. We have several people internally, if this thing's recorded, they're gonna know who they are, that are star players that aren't great with others, right. but, but they are star players, and that's always a hard thing to try to figure out what, what you're doing. So you, you've gotten a lot bigger, so you've had to change things as you grow. Well, what's the, been the, the biggest, the most obvious change that you've had to make as a leader, as a CEO, uh, with Carvana today at $850 million versus Carvana at zero five years ago? So I think um, there's, a, there's a transition that happens you know, I, I don't know exactly where, maybe, maybe around, um, it basically happens I think, once you start growing quickly, once you launch and, and ops start taking off, where all of a sudden you can't know what's going on inside the whole company anymore. Yeah. Uh, right. So kind of pre-launch and for the first six months or 12 months, you know, where you're not selling very many cars, you're trying to keep things going. I felt like I knew everything that was going on anywhere inside the company. Um, and I think that, you know, that's comforting, um, you know, when you've got views on how everything should work. I think all of a sudden when the problems start coming at you so quickly and you're growing really quickly, so you have ops over here and you're growing geographically and you've got product over here and you know, you've got HR and you've got all these different things, marketing that you're trying to focus on, you just get kind of overwhelmed and all of a sudden you realize like I, I can't know all this stuff anymore, right? Like yeah. I, I, my, I'm beyond my capacity. Um, that's a hard transition. I think now I if you set yourself up right and you have great people around, that's, that's fine, right? It ends up maybe being better. Because uh, right, maybe yeah. you just get out of people's hair and let them do what <laughs> they were gonna do anyway. Uh, but that was a, a difficult transition for me, for sure. Uh, right. I think I tried to hold on to everything for too long and just completely wore myself out. Uh, uh -huh. that, that was hard. Very yeah. common experience. Yeah. Uh, what's one thing that you do now, or one thing you value now, that other entrepreneurs might not agree with? So I think, I think the inputs to a company are basically, you need your idea, you need kind of labor, you gotta put work into it, and you need capital, right? I think mm -hmm. those are like the three fundamental inputs to any company. I think that, especially early stage entrepreneurs, they think that the idea is where the value is, um, and I really, really don't. I think e even if you, you know, move away from businesses, you move to big academic concepts like calculus or you know, evolution, there's arguments today about who invented these things, right? Like mm -hmm. the, there are many different people that can kind of claim it in different parts of the world. And I think the reason for that is because all ideas are sort of evolutionary, right? Like you, we get ideas by extrapolating from other things that we've seen. And you know, generally, like the world we live in is the same and there's five billion people on the planet. Like other people have your same ideas, right? Like they just, they just do is like the truth. And I, I think people need to recognize that. What really matters is can you go get a bunch of other people excited about that idea? And then can you build a product that consumers care about? And can you kind of implement that over time? And can you sell the story to investors and you know, fund that? And, and can you, you know, promise them enough to get that initial funding, but not so much that you necessarily fall short and then they don't believe you anymore and now you can't get the next round done? It's like, can you make it through that gauntlet? That's the, I think that's the hard thing. Um, I think the idea, you, know, you can move very quickly, sit around a campfire for an hour and you can have 15 ideas that'll take you 20 years to implement. I, I think it's more about the, the labor part of it is where value is created. Uh, so we, we talked about uh, leadership. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, specific themes around leadership, around risk taking and failure. Uh, what, what was a failure of yours, either early on with uh, Carvana or in your you know, management experience, that was brutal at the time but turned out to be a great teacher? So yeah, so, so prior to Carvana, I started a company called Luterang, which, you know, brief description, it was kind of during the Groupon heyday and it was card-linked offers. Um, it was an incredible idea that absolutely should have worked, which is, which is why I know the idea doesn't matter. Um, and we had no idea what we were doing trying to actually implement it. Um, so, you know, we went and, and worked on that really hard for a long time. I think what I realized in that, it, that's where I first realized, like, everything is way harder than you think it's gonna be, right? Yeah. Every, every hill that you think you're climbing 
it's like there's five false peaks on that hill and <laughs> you've got a lot more climbing to do right. than you think. And so I think, you know, we didn't plan for, for that properly. We didn't raise enough capital. We didn't, you know, hire enough people. We, we just, we didn't know enough about the industry. So every problem we faced, we had to figure out from scratch, you know, so we, we were always kind of starting behind. Um, I think what I learned from that is just like, you need to, you need to recognize ahead of time, even though you can't see all the challenges, it's gonna be way, 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 way harder than you think. And like that has to be part of your plan because mm -hmm. otherwise you just, you end up, you're naked, right? You're out of money and you don't have any proof that it's working. Right. You just have your kind of, all you are at that point is someone, you know, full of hot air, pitching a story to an investor with you know, proof that it doesn't work <laughs> you know, and, and asking for money and, it's, right. and then you're dead. Uh, yeah. so, That's yeah. brutal, but yeah. good to go through that experience to realize how yeah. hard it can be. And how do you think about, if you're going back to the leadership and team, how do you think about uh, um, creating an environment that encourages uh, some of that uh, risk taking that could lead to failure versus incentives for more traditional um, you know, management performance? How do you think about risk taking in, within your leadership team? I just think, I mean, we're, you know, we're a four and a half year old company. I think risk is just something we, we do. I think we're just comfortable with it, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we have to incentivize risk very much. I, I think, you know, what we try to do is be smart about the risks. So try to figure out like, where is there potentially a large payoff if it works and how do we mitigate kind of the cost when it doesn't most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Virtually everything you do won't work. Uh, you know, and then you'll get a couple wins that, you know, take longer than you think, but, but pay off and they pay you for all the ones that didn't. I just think we're very comfortable with risk and, and we know it's gonna play out like that and we try to get excited about the ideas and implement them and you know, if it doesn't work, we move to the next one. Is, if to the board members in the audience or CEOs here, is there, is there um, uh, anything else that stands out in terms of advice you'd give around how to think about risk and how to think about failure? I mean, I'm not sure this is that um, interesting, but I, I think I think you're always taking risk. I, I, not taking risk is is a risk, right? And not taking risk is is a risk with a guaranteed payoff. Like you're guaranteed to die slow, right? right uh, yeah. You know, it's like th that's what's going to happen if you don't take risks. So, I think it's a question of which risks you're going to take. And I think, I think we're in a world. It's it's interesting. If you think about, you know, imagine there's a hundred companies in some industry and they all grow by one percent and they all have one percent market share. That's an industry that's growing by one percent every single year. Now imagine that there's you know a hundred companies you know, in the market and they all have 1% share, but then every year someone comes in and takes, you know, 25% market share and everyone else shrinks by 24%. That's an industry where if you look at the industry, it's also growing by 1%, but in that industry you have massive turnover. You have like huge successive, massive failures, like all the time happening every single period. I think that's the world that we live in today. Like the macro economy is moving slower than it moved, you know, 10 years ago, right? We're growing slower as a macro economy, but there's just way more churn underneath the surface. And I think when you face that, like those companies are creating risk for you, right? Like mm -hmm. someone's gonna come in and take 25% market share if you're not paying attention. And so like you don't get to just manage risk and sit there and, right. and play it safe. Like you have to have, you know, bets placed and figure out, you know, what's going on. So I just think risk is a growing part of the economy. Um, and I think that's good for the economy that's happening. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's uh, talk about culture and values. Um, you know, we heard a lot about culture and values yesterday at the conference and uh, uh, I, how do you think about values in the context of execution? Yeah, so first of all, I think um, this is like very interesting for me because I always wondered like what is culture, right? And like, like why values? Like you, you have a culture with your family, right? Like you, you have a, a culture with your friends, you have like inside jokes and things that you think are weird and like that all exists, but like it doesn't say, you know, eat your vegetables before dessert on like your wall, you know, <laughs> and, like at your house, right? Like you don't, you don't put values up on the wall and you don't ever like codify you know, your values with your friends. So it's like, why does this have to exist inside of companies? And I, I always didn't really understand that. I think um, you know, as you start to grow, you realize like you just, it's hard to impact, you know, a big group of people, you know, with these core ideas that are really important to you. And so I think, you know, values are a good way to do that. I also think, yeah, in my experience, 98% of companies that have values, they are just empty words, right? Like if you write integrity up on the wall, I'm not sure I'm moved by that, right? As right, I walk by yeah. the integrity sign every single day. So I think you have to try to find a way to make them, you know, accessible. So like uh, you know, one of ours that I really like is don't be a Richard, which you know doesn't take a ton of time to figure out. And I think because it's a little unsettling, it makes yeah. you remember it, right? Or my favorite one um, is, you know, our next customer could be your mom. 
which I think is is cool because awesome. it, it captures yeah. so much, right? Yeah. It's like you want to give them a great experience, you want to make the technology simple, you want to make sure that it, you deal with them fairly, yeah. um, and I think it, it also it's it, it impacts you like in a way that is memorable. Um, because I think that if you're going to have values actually matter, they have to be marketed internally. Like people mm -hmm. have to remember them. Um, so I think they're important. I don't think they're that important early on because your culture and value is, they're just set by what you do every single day. And it's a small enough group of people that it's like your family, right? right. As you get bigger, I think you need to have, you know, kind of, uh, you need to have like the rules of the road kind of laid out. Yeah. And I do think yeah. they matter. Uh, do, do you, uh, again, as you've gotten bigger, your number, what's your employee count now? That you publicly stated? Uh, our last I, I, public number, I think, was around 1,300, give or take. Yeah, 1,300. Yeah. So, you know, again, to our earlier point, it's very hard to kind of understand what every one of those people are doing and what their whole story is. So those values can help kind of provide guardrails, right? Um, do, do you, some have had success tying that to performance reviews or 360s that connect back to, you know, you know these values. Do you do that at all, or, or is it still more informal? It's, yeah, so we try to keep it relatively informal. And, and you know, the way we try to think about that is we, we try to know, you know we give basically salary and you know uh, like cash compensation and then there's an equity component and I think that you know I always think about all the performance based you know comp stuff is kind of sitting in between those two things right yeah. like generally performance based comp you're picking like a metric that if you hit a lot of different metrics then the company's going to perform well right um, if people are close enough to actually impacting the outcome of the company I think it's fairly natural to just go all the way to this edge sure, right yeah, it's like if these yeah. are the two you know, corners, right. it's like you might as well start there yeah. and then over time maybe migrate toward the middle. So we live in the corners today. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I observed, um, Ernie, Ernie's team is here. Hey, guys. <laughs> With uh, no energy. <laughs> come on, like, come on. <laughs> there we go. All right. Five out uh, ten. Well, five it, and, and as they were coming in, Ernie got up and, and hugged each of them. So, you know, it, it, there are a lot I did of that so he would stay there. <laughs> so that's no, actually, yeah, so yeah. It was, it was, you know, you see these <laughs> things. And, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this lovingly as, a, as an example for an Excel company that we passed on. So our mistake. Uh, but With um, no love, by the way. <laughs> and you're going to hear no a lot. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> I, any closing uh, points of advice uh, to entrepreneurs? I think we covered a lot of ground. I, thank you guys very much for sitting here and listening to us talk. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.